I'm Andrew Slater. I work at the University of Colorado at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And one of the things that I look at is permafrost and permafrost in the context of global climate change. Permafrost is ground uh, soil or rock that is frozen uh, for more than two years. So it's continuously frozen uh, ground. And it covers, uh, well, it underlies uh, about uh, well over 25%, 30% of the, uh, the land area of the world. Uh, that's, that's, there's permafrost, which means that it's constantly frozen, and then there's seasonally frozen ground, which is ground that over winter will freeze up. So in Colorado, we have a lot of seasonally frozen ground, but then only up high in the mountains do we actually have permafrost. But the big area for permafrost, that's up in the Arctic, uh, north of the Arctic Circle generally. The, its role in climate is that it affects hydrology, it affects the ecology, Frozen ground is very hard, it's imp generally impervious to water, water runs off very quickly. Uh, you, you don't get a lot of uh, very tall trees in permafrost ground, you can't put roots down very far. So you have small shrubs, you have the tundra, uh, much like you do up high in the, uh, the alpine areas in Colorado. It, it uh, absorbs a lot of the, the cold energy, it, it maintains a, it's the refrigerator of the earth, I guess you could say that, it holds a lot of cold in it. And recently we've been seeing that in a lot of areas the temperatures of the permafrost has been increasing. So it's, it's still frozen, but that area is warming up. And in some areas uh, we have seen that permafrost has been degrading. So it's starting to thaw out, and with the thawing we're starting to see changes in terms of changes in hydrology, changes in the, um, the vegetation that is uh, able to be supported in those regions. Climate models are projecting that, yes, it is going to get warmer and that it is going to thaw in the top few meters. So permafrost can extend down for up to a kilometer in depth. So the, the area that is frozen goes down a very long way until we start to see the geothermal heat flux, the internal energy from the earth kick in. But in say Siberia, that's one and a half kilometers down, that it's, it's frozen all that way. We're not going to lose all that frozen area. The most vulnerable portion is the portion near the surface, just the top few meters. Now that might not seem that important, but it is the most important part because that area is what impacts uh, the climate system in terms of its hydrology, ecology, and the large one that could be a real surprise is what it's going to do in terms of outgassing of other greenhouse gases. So we've got a large carbon store in those upper few meters of soil high up in the Arctic, and as permafrost thaws, that carbon store that was inactive becomes active and can emit carbon dioxide or methane? One, that's one of the big questions is how much is this thawing of the permafrost going to contribute to additional outgassing of greenhouse gases? So as, as the top few meters of permafrost thaw, what happens is the carbon that was stored in those soils gets converted to gases such as carbon dioxide and methane. And those gases can then be released from the soil and they themselves contribute to the global warming problem. It is, it is quite scary, but it's not as though we all of a sudden just turn on this gas tap. This outgassing has occurred every year, um, but of course it's always been a neutral case where a little bit comes out, but then some more is stored. The concern is now as to whether there is going to be any more stored or whether it's just a one-way street. But it'll take a long time for all of that carbon to be emitted. It's not an instantaneous process. Well, wh why should people in Colorado care? Well, uh, permafrost is, as I said, you can think of it as part of the refrigerator of the, the Earth, of the global system. It is a global system, and you have to accept that fact. So uh, higher greenhouse gas emissions anywhere in the world get very well mixed within the atmosphere and can cause changes anywhere. Um, how it can affect Colorado in the future? Well, if you don't have cold polar regions, you're not going to have the same weather systems that we're used to. And you can have higher warming rates here in Colorado. So 
it, it is a global system. Everything is tied in. It's uh, some recent research that we did looked at how permafrost is impacted by the shrinking sea ice cover. And when you see rapid declines in sea ice cover, you can see that there is a distinct increase in the warming over the land surface. And that extends 1,500 kilometers or 900 miles inland. So it's not, a, it's not a closed system. What happens in one place can affect what happens in another. If we do see a large uh, increase in thaw, the projections suggest that what we'll see is an increase in river runoff. Um, part of that increase in river runoff is because as the climate warms, we will see more precipitation in the Arctic. Uh, but another part of it is, is that the ice that was stored in the soil will also run off. Um, that in itself can impact things such as sea ice. The more fresh water you put into the ocean, you actually, with fresh water, you can get an uh, increase in first year sea ice. You can impact the, the salt balance of the oceans, and that, in turn, can affect the circulation. So, it's, it's, as you can see, it's a, it's a very well an interconnected system. If the sea levels rise, then we will see a change. Something that has been occurring and has been in the news is that we've seen uh, coastal erosion increase. And that is, the, the coastal areas are uh, the land, of course, is permafrost, and so it's with warmer temperatures that exposed permafrost thaws. And so we've seen pictures up at uh, Arctic villages such as Shishmaref and Kevalina of the, uh, the coastline eroding more easily with uh, increased storminess. Um, that sort of thing we, we should expect to happen more in a warmer climate. Um, predicting that could be a little bit difficult. In, in terms of the ecology, we, what we have seen uh, is an increase in shrubbiness. So the, the low tundra has seen uh, this encroachment of taller shrubs, and that is because we've been able to, uh, we've seen that thaw depths are greater during the summer, and you can support taller vegetation. Uh, what that means, obviously, is the change in vegetation, you, you will see a change in uh, the associated wildlife that goes along with that. And it's an, an interesting thing that while on the one hand you have this outgassing, uh, you have emissions of uh, carbon-based gases such as carbon dioxide and methane from the soil as it thaws, you have this encroachment of vegetation which itself is a carbon store. So there is some balance there and it's a question of which one is going to win. Are we going to see far greater emission of uh, gases from the soil, or are we going to see a greater increase in uh, larger vegetation, wood, uh, wooded trees, shrubs, that sort of thing. So it's not, it's not an in instantaneous hit in terms of uh, carbon balance. Current projections suggest that the outgassing, the, the emissions of uh, trace gases, greenhouse gases from the soils will probably outdo uh, anything that increased vegetation can soak up, but there is this balance going on. The climate system is actually quite good at trying to restore itself. Oh, it swings one day from being completely pessimistic to, on the other hand, being optimistic. It's, there are still things we can do. There is a lot of, there's heat in the pipeline. So we have already, we've put uh, CO2 emissions into the atmosphere and we've changed things and there's heat in the pipeline even if we stopped emissions right now, kept them level at what they are right now, we will see further change for at least 50 years. So that gives us some some buffer in terms of what we can do. If we keep rocketing along and emissions are currently unfortunately outdoing the worst of the prior scenarios, um, it's not looking good. <laughs> it, it, it is a little depressing. I mean, uh, I wonder whether my home country, Australia, whether that will have snow in it. Uh, it's a very real possibility that by the end of the century, you might not see snow in Australia. Uh, Colorado, because it's a bit higher, probably will see snow. It'll, it'll stay here. But projections are that it's going to be a lot drier here. So we're not quite going to have the great ski seasons that we've had. 
um, yes, it's, there's still a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns as to what exactly will happen. Uh, and because of that, I swing between optimism and pessimism. Well, at least there's, there's larger awareness. People are demanding of politicians, that, well, what is your policy on climate change? Ten years ago, that, that didn't really occur. People, oh, they sort of knew about this issue. Oh, that's what the scientists talk about, that sort of thing. But now, it, it's a very clear election issue, uh, both here in the States, in Europe, in Australia. It is a very serious issue. People are becoming aware of it. So, with that, you never know. Things might turn around, things might change. Technology, who knows, someone could come up with something that will uh, be an amazing piece of technology that will halt CO2 emissions. I'm not holding my breath. And even if that does occur, there's a lot that can happen uh, in the meantime. So there are a lot of win-win situations that we should look at. Whether you believe in anthropogenic climate change or not, you're going to have to deal with the fact that things are changing. I think, I think everyone agrees that things are changing, whether you're a skeptic or not. We have seen warmer temperatures, and that's a, that's a fact. So you're going to have to adapt to that and try and do it in a way that is best suited to the environment. That range of possibilities all involve warming. So we, we know what's going to happen if we keep on the current trajectory. It's just a question of how bad is it going to get. One of the, the worst things that you see is, and, um, you know, if, you have a, if you have a slightly cold period, so we just saw uh, a, actually a reasonably cool uh, winter. We had a very good snow year here in Colorado. And people say, oh, well, oh, global warming, it's done and gone, it's disappeared. Uh, we had the sea ice extent come back to what it was quite a few years ago, earlier in winter. Well, it's, it's not like this problem of climate change is a, is a direct one-way street. It's not like every year we're going to see it get warmer and warmer and warmer. We have, unfortunately, seen that happen a lot uh, from the 90s onwards, but it's fluctuations about this longer-term trend. So you can have a very cold winter one year, uh, and, but the overall long-term trend is that you are seeing warming. Weather is the very short term. It's the synoptic scale fluctuations, what you have from day to day. Climate is the, definitely the longer term trend. It's the mean, the average of uh, the weather. And so you might have a cold day, but you might have five warmer days after that. So it's, you have to look at things in the, in the longer term. And climate change is all about the longer term. So just because you have a cold day or even a cold season, uh, even a cold year, uh, it does not mean that this problem of climate change has disappeared. And that, that's something that it's quite important to get that across. You see in the, uh, in the blogosphere, people say, oh, well, we had this cold winter. That's it. Climate change, it's done. These guys, they're, they're not telling us the truth. They have no idea what's going on. No, that's definitely not the case. We know that there is these, these fluctuations. And you've seen that uh, all the time in the climate record. You have this, a longer term trend, but you have fluctuations about it.